Christians. And then is there a deformity? I always read about this kind of deformity that that you see in slack wrists or patients that had, you know, injury to their scapholunate ligaments. Can we quickly just talk on what the deformity is and kind of the, I guess, mechanics behind it? Yeah, no problem. So the first, the, the reality is most of the time when this first happens or when there's an initial injury, you won't actually see much. Kind of this vague fell, uh, sometimes athletes get it and they talk about pain kind of at the dorsum of the wrist. Maybe it's a little bit swollen, but not anything too impressive. And it can easily be missed on x-rays because there's the stage where the, the gapping of the scaphoid and the lunate or um, is no is not increased until you see a dynamic grip. Here in these pictures, what you see is already when it's kind of advanced and you have the scapholunate angle here, which normal is between 30 and 60. And they generally say anything greater than 70 shows there's some sort of instability. And, it, and if you don't mind, I, you know, I think one of the easiest things when understanding this DZ deformity is just a kind of a brief breakdown of the mechanics of the uh, proximal row. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, so so the, the easiest way to think about it is the scaphoid is always trying to flex. That, that's what it wants to do. You know, the STT joint is volar, so the compressive forces push it volar. The scaphoid has to flex to get out of the way of the radi radial deviation. So if you just think about the scaphoid flexing, you're halfway to figuring out any deformity. Then you have the triquetrum, which is the opposite. Its whole goal is to extend. That's all it wants to do. And then you have the lunate in the middle, and it's bound to each of its neighbors. So when the scaphoid's trying to flex and the triquetrum's trying to extend, it's held in a relatively neutral position because it's equal. Now, if you injure one of these ligaments, say, for instance, the SL, now the lunate is untethered from the scaphoid. So now the only acting force on that lunate is the triquetrum extending. And now you see on this picture on the right, you can see that red line is actually the axis of the lunate pointing dorsally or tipping dorsally. And that causes that capitate and that lunate uh, to start getting increased contact pressure on the edges and arthritis. So I like to think of it in a mechanical way because it was, you know, especially when I was a resident trying to remember these, what does what, I felt like if I could remember the scaphoids flexing and the triquetrum's extending and the lunate's neutral, then I would know if it was a DZ or a VZ, which isn't really this topic, uh, which way it'd be going. Ah, that's a good, um, uh, that's a great way to think about it because I'm, I'm still learning this stuff now and I, you know, I, I have trouble remembering it too, but if we just remember that the scaphoid likes to flex and that triquetrum likes to extend and lunate is kind of in between trying to keep them neutral. If you have any injury to the, you know, scaphoid lunate ligaments, your scaphoid is going to want to flex and then there's nothing. Um, and then your triquetrum, which normally wants to extend, will extend with the lunate. So that's kind of gives you your dissy, uh, dissy deformity. What does dissy stand for, by the way? It's dorsal, dorsal intercalated segmental instability. 